Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, welcome to NASM AFA Optima Online. My name is Prentice, and I have very special guests with me today. We have uh, Rodney Korn, and we have Kyle, Dr. Kyle Stull with us, uh, and I'll introduce them a little bit more later, but what we're going to talk about today is corrective exercise and Olympic weightlifting and how we want to be able to use the, C, the material in the CES and the weightlift to enhance function. Uh, I know that just because of the way the industry is, sometimes corrective exercise is framed as uh, solely as reducing the risk of injury. But if you look at this athlete there, this is, I'd say, Olympic weightlifting and the gymnastic floor exercise. Uh, it's the ultimate expression of, of power, strength, flexibility out of out of all of the sports. And we want to help athletes like this to be able to maximize their potential. So we're going to teach you. Well, not I won't. These gentlemen will teach you how to use both of these systems, integrate them to help maximize the performance of your community. So let's go ahead and get started. And we can go ahead to the next slide. So the agenda for today is we're going to talk about the history of the OPT model. And that is also why uh, Rodney's here. He's one of the he's one of the first. He he's one of the people responsible for shaping uh, shaping this model, shaping this system to what we understand today. So we're going to give you a little bit of a historical context of the OPT model, and we're going to talk about the history of ALECO and, uh, and the history of Olympic weightlifting. We're going to talk about the primary lifts, and we're going to talk about what the athletes need, and that's what it's referenced by needs analysis. We're gonna talk about what the athletes need to perform all of these lifts uh, successfully so that they can express their power and enhance their performance. And hang around until the very end because we do have a, a promotion code for today for a discount on Aleco products and for the CES course. And as always, we're gonna have Q&A. So you'll be able to type your questions in and we will answer them as best as we can. And as I said, I have here Rodney Korn. He's the director of education for Aleco. He is the co-founder and former COO of PTA Global and the co-founder of SOMA. And as I mentioned, he is the former director of education uh, for NASM and we are very lucky to have him on today. Uh, Rodney, tell us a little bit more about yourself and uh, and maybe if you can, tell us about our uh, chance meeting uh, several months ago. Yeah, so thank you, Prentice, and uh, it's great to be part of this. And thank you everyone for, for being part of this and for your time and energy, deeply appreciate it. I always appreciate people willing to take time out of their busy schedules to share and, and just enjoy some camaraderie and hopefully get some information out of it, which is the, the ultimate purpose. Yeah, so I'm the OG. So I've, uh, I've been around the block a few times and I was one of the people who was at the beginning of the OPT model. And uh, my story is, is fairly unique. Uh, obviously got to NASM in 1999, straight out of uh, my master's thesis and was big into sports. And, and at the time there was no real structure to NASM. I met Mike Clark. He was doing a he was doing a workshop with Vern Gambetta, and Mike was just a brilliant, young, uh, extremely intelligent and organized person. And he went through this whole process, and long story short, uh, I had Neil Cruz talk with Mike Clark. Mike Clark, we swindled him into coming on from his physical therapy practice in Arizona to, to take over and, and provide his information to de develop an actual process and at the time, it was the first periodized process in personal training, aside from the CSCS, which NSCA already had, but there was nothing in personal training, and, and Mike brought the OPT model. Uh, and it looked a little different then than it does now. But that's, that's where, 
that's where this all came from. So I was just absolutely honored, and it was a it was a complete pleasure to work with and under Mike, and and be a mentor as even though I'm about 40 years older than he is, and be able to just learn from from his brilliance. So uh, interestingly enough, as the world goes and as this industry goes, I had to go to China to meet Prentice. Uh, heard about him, knew about him, but. Uh, was in China and we were in, it was Shanghai, wasn't it? Was it Shanghai? Yeah, it was, yeah, it was Shanghai. So we were in Shanghai and Kyle was there, Princess was there. I've known Kyle for a long time. So Kyle, Kyle and I go, go way back for many, many years. Uh, he's not as old as I am. But uh, so we were there and I walked into this, this gym at the hotel and was working out and saw this guy doing some stuff. And it's like, I'm back in my mind, I was like, that reminds me of like some NASM stuff I used to see you do. And so we got to just talking, and all of a sudden he said he worked for NESM, blah, blah, blah. And I said, oh, I said, hey, well, my name's Rodney Korn. And he's like, oh, you're Rodney Korn. I said, yeah. So there were us, two NESM guys, and had some other people in the room, and, and it, was, it was a cool experience. So that has led to a lot of this, and, and here we are. So it's a, it's a deep, deep honor and deep pleasure to be here. So Thank you for that. And we also have Dr. Kyle Stahl. Uh, uh, master of ed, master of education. He's uh, he's responsible for uh, doing a large amount of our educational content. He is uh, also one of the reviewers of CES, a professor of uh, a professor at Concordia River Forest, and also uh, a master cowboy. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more about yourself? <laughs> Thank you, thank you, thank you, and uh, it is it is kind of hard to follow up, uh, Rodney. There, as in 1998-99, I was still in high school, and the uh, only sport I ever played was was rodeo, perhaps a, a Texas thing. So, um, yeah, in 98-99, I was I was rodeoing, and uh, fitness and exercise was the the last thing that that I I would think about. Um, but anyway, fast forward uh, a few years, I got into personal training and uh, I've been a master instructor for an ASM for a little over a decade now. I think it's been about 11 years. Um, <clears throat> and Rodney and I, we've worked together on several, several projects. I think one of the things I've probably never told you, Rodney, is how influential you were in in the development of my career. And I'm sure a lot of people have the same story I do. But I vividly remember the uh, the VHS, the CD-ROMs, listening to your voice, watching some of those videos with uh, with NASM. So uh, I really appreciate not only the work you've done with NASM, but of course everything else you've done in the industry. Um, you're, you're definitely uh, you're definitely a game changer in in my opinion. And and uh, it seems like everywhere you, you leave a, a strong footprint. So I uh, appreciate all the work you've done. And I'm very excited to, to get to spend a few minutes with you here discussing corrective exercise and weightlifting. Yeah. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, gentlemen. And as I said, uh, today you can save, today only, you can save 15% on the apparel quit. And you can also save 35% on the new CES course with the, it's a phone only uh, promo code. So we will give you that information at the end. And with that said, let's, let's dive right in. Hopefully today it's gonna be wall to wall content for you so that you all can leave uh, with something. So what we wanna do right now is since you were here from the beginning, Rodney, why don't you tell us tell us about the the, the first uh, evolution of the OPT model? Yeah. So first and foremost, those of you that uh, that are familiar with NESM and the OPT model, hopefully you understand that it is a massively powerful system. Uh, if you don't realize that it's massively powerful, then it may just be that there's more to it than than you may know. Also. Uh, it's, it has so many different variances I can go through and, and we've, we've trimmed it down since then, but where it started is it originally came with seven phases. And so when, when I met Mike and Mike and myself, and there was also Lenny Parasino, who's another phenomenal educator in the industry. Uh, when we were sitting down with Mike and we were going through it, cause we were initially the first people that were exposed to it and we're going to be developing it for NASM back in near 2000, we had the seven phases. And phase one was corrective exercise training. 
And so we had all these acronyms and people, if you were, if you're, if you're old school and you've been around and you've seen, seen the transformation, you know, we had all the acronyms. So there was corrective exercise training. And then the stabilization endurance was actually uh, more of the, the stabilization. It was integrated stabilization training. And then we had stabilization equivalent, which was kind of like strength endurance, which was phase three. So two was, was integrated stabilization training. Phase three was stabilization equivalent. And that's when we took a strength exercise and a stability exercise. So it was like a superset. The original, which most people don't know, originally that was actually reversed. It was a stabilization exercise superseted with a strength okay. exercise. Okay. Uh, Kyle, can you pick up on that? Can I? Yeah, Rodney, we lost you. Uh, we lost you a second. Yeah. Uh, Regarding the super set, we got Rodney. Okay. Yeah. Back? Yeah. We're okay. Back. Phase three, which, orig which originally was a stabilization exercise, followed by immediately followed by a super set with a strength exercise. That we changed. We had a discussion, myself, Lenny, and Mike said, what, what do you think we should do? And while there is a there is a bigger continuum than you'll probably ever see that we've that we've developed. I personally have about four different models for the OPT model. Uh, we decided on the strength followed by a stability, and that was phase three. And then phase four was our muscular development. And then phase five was what we called uh, elastic, uh, elastic equivalent training. I'm sorry, it was the max power. So we had muscular development, phase four. Phase five was, mus uh, was max power. I'm sorry, max strength. And then phase six was the elastic equivalent, which is what we ha what we had a strength exercise followed by a power exercise. And then phase seven was max power. So it went all the way from corrective exercise through stabilization training to the strength endurance, which is the stabilization followed or the strength followed by stability, then muscular development, then max strength, then the hybrid of strength power, and then we went into max power. So we had all of those phases. Uh, which was sequentially laid out in a uh, beautiful system, beautiful system to start with. And I'll turn that over to Kyle because since then, we, you have, you've changed that. There have been some changes. And I think one thing to point out about that too, uh, you mentioned a couple of times, uh, you mentioned periodization. So it's important to understand that the OPT model is a periodized model, it's periodization. That is a, it's a cyclical, uh, cyclical program and it depends on the sport, it depends on the athlete, but you would you know, program through this uh, basically year round. Um, and since it is, you know, each time it would progress with the athletes, you can progress the exercises. So it's really, it's really a, a, a system that, that is never ending. And to your, to your point, or as you stated, um, it just has so much potential of everything that can fit in there. And uh, we can see here on this slide where it was those seven phases that, that Rodney, Rodney described well. And then there's been a few different progressions, but now sort of what we've what we've settled on is we separated out that phase one so that corrective exercise training there's so much to that there's so much complexity there's so much depth that we thought it deserved its own platform so we've separated that off of the model and that's where you have your corrective exercise specialization but i do think it's important to understand that just because we've separated it doesn't mean it's separate from the model it still is an integral part of that process. And that's one of the things we'll talk about today. And by separating that out, that turned it into a six phase model. Um, and that's where we can see now more of that performance based model is, is going to be those six phases. They've changed names a little bit from what Rodney just said, but it's basically the, the same approach that, that, that they had uh, you know, back in the day whenever they first first came up with this. And then uh, a, a bit more streamlined model is going to be, uh, we, we call it the fitness model that's for the certified personal trainer. And that's going to be the five phase model. And that's what we see there on the slide where we start with that stabilization uh, endurance training, and then we will progress up through strength, endurance, hypertrophy, uh, max strength, and then we get, we get power. So Essentially, we still get those same adaptations that we would that we would train for an athlete with that stabilization, strength, and power. It's just a, it comes in a, a bit smaller smaller package. So that's where we are now. Thank you for that, Kyle. And uh, both of you brought up a couple of interesting points. And just the the, the concept of of periodization or planned planned training. 
over the course of the year. So either one of you, we'll start with you, Rodney. Uh, why is planning why is planning important for the athlete and, and as a personal train or for a personal training client? Yeah, so these these are great questions, and this is the fundamentals of, of actually programming, and it really comes down to stress. I mean, what we're talking about is stress. So when we talk about a periodized program, realize that it's just a way of manipulating acute variables, and acute variables are simply just a means to monitor the amounts of stress that's being placed into somebody's system and how that stress is being placed, depending on whether it's load, the endurance capacity, you're following a continuum that basically takes someone from more of an aerobic capacity, more of an endurance-based training into more of an explosive, if you go all the way up in a linear fashion, more of explosive. So you're changing energy system, which is changing the stress in the system. You're changing loads, you're changing force. So it's a way of monitoring all of these variables, which in essence is saying, how can I organize and systematically progress the body to adapt to a certain response and then get it to achieve a better response or a higher response and not kill it. And that's the whole purpose of periodization. When done properly, it actually controls the amount of stress that will be placed upon the system so you can increase performance and, and, and potentially decrease the risk of injury all at the same time when done correctly. Thank you for that. And uh, Kyle, for you, uh, we uh, let's talk about the difference between what strength is and what power is, because just uh, maybe with uh, lay knowledge, we define power as doing one of the one of the big three, one of the the big three lifts, the the deadlift, squat, and bench, and uh, definitely uh, amazing feats. But what's the difference between strength and power? for our uh, listeners out there. So whenever we, whenever we look at the definitions, uh, strength is the ability to uh, create or increase internal tension to overcome an external force. So we would look at this in terms of you, in, you improve strength or increase strength by increasing motor unit recruitment, motor unit synchronization. So we're teaching the muscle to be able to recruit more muscle fibers quicker. So that's going to be your, your strength. However, whenever we look at power, this is going to re relate more to rate of force production. The two are definitely related, but power, you can think of it as being more speed of movement, rate of force production, where strength is going to be more of that, um, you know, the, uh, the, the one-time production of force, if, if that makes sense. And one of the, the important things to look at with power and Rodney had talked a little bit earlier about some supersets uh, and also in his little talk there about the, the periodization. It's important to understand that the human organism is breakable. We're an adaptable organism. We will adapt to the stresses that are placed on us. Whenever we look at something like the, the supersets that are used there in, in power training, so we would superset a strength exercise with a power exercise, we, we combine mass and acceleration and that gives us this total increase in, in force production. So so we see that the two, while their definitions are different, they definitely uh, are interrelated and will relate to that overall force production and, and performance. Okay, thank you for that. So now let's move on and talk a little bit about, uh, again, because for those of you who've seen me, that's all I, uh, it's all I talk about is corrective exercise. Uh, but really what corrective exercise is and why this is important for performance is what we want to get down to is uh, building targeted warm-up and strength exercises, targeted flexibility and strength exercises so that the athlete can, uh, can in a sense, when we, as we're talking about uh, Olympic weightlifting or any sport, work on their mechanics to better express their, their potential. So Kyle, you're the, you're the editor, you're the master reviewer for CS. Let's dive into corrective exercise and, and take us through what it is, what it isn't, and those four steps in that process. For sure. And uh, Princess, it seems like each time you add on another layer. So this time it was master reviewer. And I, I think each time we're, we're actually moving further and further away from the, the actual truth. <laughs> <laughs> 
But you should hear my fishing stories. <laughs> so whenever we look at the definition here, the process of identifying neuromusculoskeletal dysfunction, developing a plan of action, and implementing corrective strategy. One of the things about that definition for corrective exercise that I think is really important to understand is it describes corrective exercise as a process. It is not one particular exercise or it is not one particular set or groups of exercises that, that are corrective exercises. It's that entire process. You must implement an assessment to try to identify the, the root cause or what is the maybe the primary impairment cause of muscle imbalances. And then we must develop a plan of action. That's going to be your, your program design. And we can see down there, assess, design, and execute. And then you must properly execute those exercises that, that you design. And we need to think of it as that process. And with that, it fits into, into a lot of different aspects of, uh, of a training program. Um, the, whenever we look at the four steps over here, so inhibit, lengthen, activate, and integrate. So this is going to come, this is our programming strategy. So we use our assessments to identify the muscles that are Mechanically short or overactive, and sometimes uh, you know those terms can we, we kind of we can have some loose definitions or interpretations of those those terms. They can mean different things. However, we would identify what is what is short, what's causing the impairment, and then we're going to inhibit that. So our first step is going to to use a myofascial intervention or myofascial technique. There's a lot of different research as far as this is concerned as well. Um, we call it inhibit. However, whenever we look at the research, there's some different information there. Uh, one of the things that I think is important to understand with the research is there's not really one specific method that is replicated. So it's really difficult to know exactly what we're doing. So these are, we have some good evidence, but we really haven't gone to, into the depth of the studies to, to really be able to identify these exact changes from, from foam rolling. Anyway, we're going to think of that as trying to reduce tension and mobilize stuck tissue. And then we move to lengthen. So this is going to be uh, different types of stretching. We, we frequently use static stretching. And uh, static stretching, all we're trying to do is increase tissue or that stretch tolerance. So it's something where it, it takes place over time. It works with the nervous system. And we slowly improve the ability of those muscles to demonstrate their full extensibility. I want you to think of those two as being mobility strategies. And we're going to apply those to the, the muscles that are short on one side of the joint. On the other side of the joint, we have to activate or we have to re-excite or upregulate the muscles that aren't really doing uh, their job. And this is where we see the activate. And this is going to be isolated strengthening. One of the things with these activated exor activation exercises or isolated strengthening, we know that the body works in functional force couples, not, not in isolation. However, we can put somebody in a position and we can use a specific uh, you know, technique or strategy to emphasize one particular part of a muscle. And it's basically just trying to wake it up. We're just trying to get it to, to wake up. So we've, we've lengthened one side of the joint, we've activated the other side of the joint, and that last step, number four, this is going to be integrated. Think of this reteaching uh, or reteaching a pattern, uh, motor control, motor learning. So what we're trying to do here is teach the nervous system what to do with that newfound mobility and that newfound strength. Um, so that's a few few points on the corrective exercise continuum. I could keep going, but maybe I'll save some stuff for the the other webinars. And I know that we're going to get into this today, but this is where the link is. And Kyle brought up a good point. You have to follow the process end to end to get the, the benefits of it. And you'll see, you'll learn later from Rodney some integration techniques that are taken from Olympic weightlifting that fit nicely into the, the corrective exercise model. When we're re-educating athletes' movement patterns, it's it's going to be, there may be general skills, but it, in, if we're working with athletes, it's going to be specific to that skill. In this case, Olympic weightlifting. So now, uh, Rodney, can you tell us a little more about uh, Aleco, how this company came to be, and its contribution to sport? 
U.S. This is a phenomenal story. So when I got to Aleco and I heard about this, this was great. So first off, the, the company Aleco has been around for a long time, almost a century now. But from an athletic standpoint, they're the worldwide leader in weightlifting, powerlifting, strength conditioning. And we've been doing that for about 60 years now. So the company, way back in the early 1900s, started originally as an electrical appliance company. So the name Aleco is really Electrical Installation Company. That's the L-A, the A, the I, the Co. So that's where it came from. And they did all kinds of appliances, and one of them was happened to be a waffle iron which makes great waffles, by the way. So, and I know, Princess, you love waffles, so that's always a good thing. So, yes. in, in 1957, one of the workers was a weightlifter. And when we say weightlifting, we're talking about Olympic lifting. Weightlifting and Olympic lifting are kind of synonymous. And when this person was involved in competitions, the bars would always break. So he went to the company and said, hey, what if we make a bar out of Swedish the company is a Swedish company, and the, our headquarters is in Sweden, Homestead, Sweden, which is absolutely beautiful. And so they made a bar. And an interesting side note is the, the knurling pattern or the little patterns that you see on the bar for grip, that's actually was came from the design of the waffle. So they took that waffle iron pattern and they turned that into the actual knurling, which is called the knurling, which is the gripping on the bar. So we created this Swedish steel bar, and Swedish steel is, is an extremely strong steel. And in 1963, this bar was in one of the competitions. It was the first bar to ever be utilized in a competition without breaking. So all of a sudden, we became a well-known commodity and a very sought-after commodity. Uh, then in 1969, in the, in the company, somebody decided that what if we took a bicycle tire and wrapped it around the, the weight itself so we could drop it and it wouldn't make lots of noise and or break and or create any type of uh, destruction. So that was the first and the beginning of the bumper plate in 1969. Since then, we've gone on to do many things. We're certified in the IWF, which is the International Weightlifting Federation, the IPF, which is the International Powerlifting Federation, and also very importantly, the WPPO, which is the World Para. Uh, powerlifting organization. So that's for the para athletes in the Paralympics. We've had more than a thousand world records on our Aleco barbells. Uh, you'll see them predominantly a lot, lots of world championships and most of the world championships, as well as the Olympic Games and and Paralympic Games. So that's kind of the background, just real simplistically of it was has been sought after and utilized in the world of weightlifting, powerlifting, and strength conditioning. Yeah, and this this thank you for mentioning that, uh, Rodney, and this actually ties together my love of bars, Nike shoes, and uh, and waffles. They all came from the waffle iron. Uh, so I'm in good company. So Rodney, can you can you continue on and tell us uh, about the history of Olympic weightlifting? Yeah, so weightlifting and lifting of weights has been around for a long time, for centuries. The, the, the weightlifting first appeared in the Olympic sport, in the Olympics in 1896, but it was kind of just a hodgepodge. It wasn't really organized. Uh, it bounced back again in 1904, and then it took some time off. We had World War I, and then it was formally an Olympic sport in 1920. And at the time, it used both one-handed, as you can see in that uh, top left-hand corner picture. It used one-handed as well as two-handed lifts. So they had a one-handed clean and jerk, they had one hand snatched, and then they had the two-handed versions as well. They had a clean and press uh, back in, uh, from 1928 when they started. They we actually dropped the one-handed lifts in 1928. Uh, I don't know a specific reason why they were dropped. You can only speculate. I don't have that, that specific information. But in... From 1928 to 1972, they had three primary lifts. There was a clean and press, which uh, if, if you've ever seen people bending really far backward and pressing, that's the clean. So they would pick the bar up, get it to their shoulders, and then they would push it overhead. And then they have the snatch and then the clean and jerk. The clean and jerk is more of an explosive lift to get the bar overhead. In 1972, they dropped the clean and press. And so we were left with the two primary lifts that we now hear about a lot, and that's the clean and jerk and the snatch. So the two primary Olympic lifts, clean and jerk and snatch, are typically what we say are the weightlifting, the weight lifts or the weightlifting lifts of, of the Olympics. 
Okay, that's great. And then can you can you tell us, especially those uh, those of us who are novices or just completely new to these types of lifts, what are the differences uh, between the snatch and the clean and jerk? Yeah, so on the next slide, we'll show you a couple of pictures and you'll see the top one is the snatch. So the snatch is basically both the snatch and the clean and jerk are a way to get the barbell from the ground to overhead. In the snatch, we do one particular motion. So in the snatch, there's, a, there's typically a wider grip, slightly different starting position when you're coming from the floor. And then you'll go from the ground and you'll come all the way up overhead in one, one mo movement. The clean and jerk, you'll see in the bottom picture, they'll rack it to the shoulder and then they'll stand up with that weight depending on how you're doing it. And then from there, they'll do a jerk, which is more of an explosive, just requires a knee bend and then it's a, you're dipping under the bar and, and pressing it overhead and that's the difference. Two movements versus one movement. And that's the, the Olympic versions of that. That's the full version. Now, the, the caveat I wanna bring into that is that for the health and fitness world or for uh, even a lot of strength conditioning, if you look at a lot of uh, universities, high schools, a lot of people won't do the full rest. They'll do a power snatch or a power lean, or they'll do a hang version, whether it's a hang power snatch or a hang clean. or a, So they'll, they'll break it. A lot of people will just do the clean. They won't do the jerk. So there's a variety of ways that we can use those and we don't have to use, in this case, these are Olympic lifts and Olympic lifters. We don't have to use max loads and we don't have to use the full, the full lift itself if we don't need to and if the person can't actually do that, which is how that starts relating into the corrective exercise. Well, uh, so yeah, on the next slide, what we wanna do is Take a look at those uh, positions that you were talking about, and uh, just a, just a little story. I when I started Olympic weightlifting a while ago, and my coach, who was from honestly from the former Soviet Union, told me that I was going to be uh, worthless as an Olympic weightlifter. So he only allowed me to hang and do power exercises. Uh, so can you go over these movements and where it and which type of lifter they all benefit? Yeah. So first off, the, the Olympic lifts or the these Olympic style lifts have benefit for any and everybody when you get the person to do it at their level. Uh, they teach coordination. They teach balance. They provide strength and they provide power. All of those are attributes that everyone needs. So when when we're talking about this and those of you that are listening if you're a weightlifter or if you're an Olympic lifter, you're a competition person, then you, you know the value of those. You know how important they are. If you're not, I don't want you to be afraid of them. One of the things at Lego that we want people to do is, is not be afraid or intimidated by the Olympic lifts or weightlifting, but realize that there's a continuum that you can learn on. And if you decide that you want to get into competition, then there's obviously a lot more to learn. But if you just want to learn the basics and learn some very powerful, pun intended, exercises, then these are these are excellent. So here we have essentially three different starting positions or places that you can begin the movement from. So when you do an Olympic lift or you're doing competition, you have to start from the floor. So the floor is taking, you take that bar from there and either rack it to your shoulder for a clean and then go from there above for the jerk or you go from one motion up overhead for the snatch. But you can also start at the knee. And a lot of times this is called kind of a hang position. So just above the knee, you can do the same thing. So it just takes out one component of that. And then you can also start and do stuff from the hip. And so at each, at each phase or each starting position, there are different actions that we'll break these down into so you can see, and then we'll do that on the next slide. So realize that you don't have to start from the floor if you don't want to you can start from the knee or the hip. And then the way we teach it at LACO is we'll teach it top down. Some people go bottom up, there's nothing wrong with that. We teach it top down. So we'll teach everything from the hip. So we have a, a very simple system of stance, grip, and position. So looking at the snatch, the stance is gonna be your feet are about hip width. And your toes may or may not be slightly turned out depending on who you are. Usually if you're gonna go into an explosive jump, a lot of times the toes will turn out and that's only to help the hips 
get into the position that they need. The grip is going to be a wider grip, as we mentioned about, because the snatch is going to go up overhead in one position. It's going to be hard to take the bar from here and bring it up when the hands are really close. So the hand position is a lot wider, and you want to make sure that the knuckles are down. A lot of times people will keep them, it's like a throttle. If your throttle is back, it's going to be hard to get control of the bar, and it's hard for, for the pulling aspect of it. And then the position, like I said, floor, knee, or hip is where you can start. So that's the beginning. So there, with each of these, there are different actions that occur. So the snatch and the clean have similarities in actions. It's just how we finish that looks slightly different. So that first picture you see there, and by the way, that's Patrick Warmel. He's our, he's our uh, military education person. And uh, that's, that's giving some props to him and also give props to, to Lauren Heiser. She was on our education team, education manager, and she's actually – done competitive weightlifting. So she's stronger than, than uh, he and I put together. But, but in, in the snatch, and then we'll get to the clean in a second, but in that, when we have our stance grip position, once you get set up and you have your stance grip in position where you're gonna start from, now there's different phases of the lift that you can, you can start working on. So you don't have to do the whole thing at one time. One of the smartest ways is to learn each phase and kind of master the phase and so you can sequentially build into it. That first one, we call it a drive shrug. A lot of people will just call it a pull. Sometimes that's called the second pull. And so that's just a pull. And basically just think of it as going into triple extension and just popping the shoulders up like a shrug. So it's like a shrugging with triple extension. You can see that he goes onto his toes there. And then from that, you go into a high pull and that's where the elbows come out. So we're getting the bar set in a position and then we pull under and that's where you're going to start to actually pull yourself under the bar, not necessarily pull the bar up. And then the last one is the, the catch. And so the, the clean and then you'll stand after the bar. That's the snatch. So it's just coming all the way up and then you stand. The clean and the jerk be very, very similar. So you still have the hip width. You have those slightly the grip is just going to be closer. It's going to be just outside your thighs or shins, depending on where you're starting. And then you're going to have the knuckles down. And again, you can start from that. Now, you'll also notice here that we have the shoulders packed or engaged, and they're over the bar. When we say the shoulders are packed and engaged, it just means that when you're holding the bar, you're actually engaging your, let's just keep it simple, you're engaging your lats. You're keeping the, the shoulder back and down so you're not shrugging up or you're not Punched forward. And that's just a, uh, an indication to keep people or a way to help them understand that I need to be actively involved with the bar. Uh, that's one of the things that people do is they'll just grab the bar and start to move instead of getting set. We call it respecting the bar or respecting the lift. Same All right. Way. Drive, you have the, the, the drive there, the first one, which is just kind of your dog, and then you have the high pull. And then you're going to get into the pull under, then the catch. Remember the clean, you're going to catch here. The snatch, you catch overhead. And then from there, you have the jerk, which is going to go overhead. It's, that's simplistically the actions that you'll see based upon your stance grip position. Uh, a real quick comment, if you don't mind. Um, the and I may be I may be butchering this this uh, this quote here, but I heard Dr. Stu McGill uh, one time talking about. And if you don't know who he is, I would say he's one of the. For those of you listening, I know Rodney knows, but the uh, he's arguably one of the leading low back researchers of our time, an incredibly dynamic speaker. So I would encourage you to read his information and, and look up anything you can of his. Uh, but anyway, he, he talks about lifting and he says, uh, I believe he was talking specifically about the snatch. And he says one of the things that separates the elite is their ability to and how quickly uh, they can relax to drop underneath the bar, but then also the confidence they have to be able to relax and drop underneath the bar. So it kind of goes to what you were saying about kind of that 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 hang to where you're almost uh, pulling yourself under the bar. But I just thought that was a unique perspective. Right. Yep. So uh, talking about this next slide, the so those lifts require a lot of strength, a lot of flexibility. Uh, a lot of balance and stability, and there are a lot of uh, 
there are a lot of areas for this to potentially break down for the athlete. So uh, Rodney and then Kyle follow up. Let's talk about this needs analysis of what uh, what an athlete would need to successfully uh, perform perform these two lifts. Yes. Yeah, so to that point, I mean that's a whole webinar in itself. So there is a lot that goes into that. But in essence, you need to have the ability from from the ankle up. And you, I mean, you can think of it as the kinetic chain checkpoint. So for NASM, and you you understand the checkpoints. Just go from ankle all the way up to to the cervical spine, and you'll know that you you need to have dorsiflexion. Anytime we're going to be bending or squatting in a, in a position, you need to have a certain amount of dorsiflexion. There also needs to be plantar flexion. A lot of people forget about that part because you have to be able to get into a plantar flex position to set up the the, the other phases to because you're exploding. You're basically doing almost like a vertical jump, that type of triple extension, because you want to triple extend in that position. So you need hip flexion and extension. And a lot of times we always think, man, I need to have hip extension, hip extension, but you've got to be able to have hip flexion to get into the right positions so you can grab. And so we saw earlier when we were in the floor position, you've got to have pretty good hip flexion to be able to get down to that to match with your dorsiflexion. Thoracic spine extension, because both of them, if you do the jerk after the clean, they're going to be overhead lifts. But even if you don't, to do a front squat and to get the elbows through and to be able to rest here, you need to have thoracic spine uh, mobility and stability. You have to have the ability to extend through the thoracic spine. That takes the pressure off the shoulder girdles. And then through the shoulder, you got to be able to elevate, and then you have to abduct and externally rotate. Whether it's abduct and externally rotate here or abduct and externally rotate here. So... That's really important, and oftentimes any one of those can be a limiting factor, and that's the per that's the whole reason for having a CES process to find out where are you in the starting position and what would be the best things for you to begin working on to gain the the, the strength, the balance, the coordination, and the power to progress up and to become better uh, and even stronger and more stable in these particular lifts. Uh, so that thank you for that, Rodney. And, and my spider sense is telling me that we are going to get a question later uh, during Q and A about foot position. Uh, can you can you talk about that? You mentioned it. Can you talk about that just a little bit more uh, about how your foot position influences uh, the different lifts and also different segments, uh, different derivatives of each lift? Yeah. So in in simplicity. A lot of times in the, the snatch, because of the difference uh, uh, of the snatch for most people, sometimes the feet will end up being wider because you're in a squatted position with your hands overhead. So those of you that do an overhead squat, you know that that's not always the easiest. But if you have weight that's overhead and you're squatting down, a lot of times the stance is going to need to be wider than having a narrow hip width stance. So you can start hip width, but once you get up and you come – Usually there's there's kind of that hop, that pull under where the bars from here, you're actually pulling, but it's going from you're dropping. You're basically dropping down from an extended, triple extended position down. And a lot of times the feet will sit in this position and allow you to sit down. When you turn the feet out, the object is, is to keep the knees tracking over the feet because that will help the hips open up and allow you to get into a lower position so you can have a safer squat. That'll That'll take pressure off of the thoracic spine all the way up and the shoulder girdle. Because if the hips can't move properly, you guys know from an NASM standpoint through all the kinetic chain, if I can't get my hips to move, I'm going to have to have compensation somewhere else. And so that's where people will do that, especially as you get into heavier lifts. So you keep the body in a, a safe and a sound of a position to ensure that you have proper stability and mobility and you're not putting too much pressure on one specific area. A lot of times that'll end up being the, the shoulder girdles with us from the front of it. So okay. the position is kind of necessity. In the clean, a lot of times, depending on who you are, the clean can stay a little bit straighter because when you go into that front squat position, you don't have to get super wide depending on your strength and depending on your levers and the lengths and everything of that nature. So. That's the, the general basis for why the foot position may, may change. And uh, it's about as simple as you can keep it. Okay. Now, uh, I'm sure there, there may be people listening whose uh, portal of entry into fitness started strictly 
uh, within ASM. And I've always told people I've worked with that uh, having that having that turnout necessary to achieve the skill in a lift is okay, provided that your other training your other training allows you to, uh, or you have some programming in there with your foot pointing straight ahead. Uh, Kyle, what are your thoughts? What are your thoughts about that? Yeah, I absolutely agree, and that's one of the uh, one of the reasons the the bullet there says necessity of, of variance. You know, it's really important to understand, like we talked about earlier, and I mentioned as well. The, we're an adaptable organism. We're designed to move in a lot of different positions. We're designed to do a lot of different things, and we need to. Or there's nothing wrong with training a little bit in all those different positions. However, whenever we well, one of those positions includes the feet straight. So I oftentimes think it's funny whenever people will listen to me say that and agree. However, whenever we try to ask them to squat with their feet straight, then they have an argument or excuse as to why they don't need to do that. We should be able to do all of that and maybe even some toe turned in or type type position. So it really just uh, it just depends on what it is you need to do. However, you have to be able to do them all. You can't really dominate one. So whenever we look at our assessment process, well, this part of the reason, but in assessment process, we will encourage people to keep their feet straight. That is uh, for a couple of reasons. A, that mimics a lot of the functional movements that we look at. So whenever you're walking, when you're running, whenever you're climbing stairs, going downstairs, ideally we want our feet to be straight. Uh, the other thing, whenever we look at ankle mechanics, so in order to assess sagittal plane motion through that talar pearl joint, we need to squat with the feet relatively straight. There may be a small amount of turnout of, up to about five to seven degrees, but relatively speaking, that's very little turnout. Uh, and the other thing is, as a corrective exercise specialist or a coach or anybody designing a program, I have to have a standardized process. And I can't allow people to put their feet on these different uh, positions for the assessment process. So if you start with the feet straight and you reassess with the feet straight each time, then you have that, you have that system, you have that standardization standardization. Um, and the other thing I wanted to highlight is Rodney specifically said, uh, you gave a, a few options, but you started off talking about how whenever you catch it, the feet go out. So that's one of those that makes perfect sense. You increase your base of support. You want to keep the alignment of the spine in that position, especially if it's a lot of weight, you may vary your foot position and that that's perfectly acceptable. Okay. So thank doctor, you for that. And let's stay with you. Uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Stull, the man who wrote the book on no, foam rolling. Uh, now we want to start to uh, draw the conclude uh, or make the connection. Why, why corrective exercise? What is going on? Uh, we talked about a lot, a lift with a lot of different timing and complexity. Why corrective exercise? Why do we need this? Um, so this slide right here, what we're really trying to do is get the body to coordinate everything together. If we want to have optimal function working through this backwards, if we want to have that optimum movement, we have to have proper coordination, proper control. That's going to be the neuromuscular control. So the nervous system uh, speaking with the muscular system. In order to have that, we have to have the optimal or close to ideal skeletal alignment. And those break up into the three different divisions. So we have the muscular system, the nervous system, and the skeletal system. Whenever we look at that muscular system, the, the length tension relationships, in order for a muscle to produce uh, produce force, reduce force with eccentric contractions and to stabilize joints, we have to have this ideal length tension relationship. And that's really going to be looking at posture and that's where we'll start to get into our assessments. With that, that ideal length tension relationship, then the nervous system can recruit the muscle it needs to recruit for that optimal performance. The, we're master, master compensators, and the body will find a way to get from point A to point B, whether or not it is, it is leading to some sort of de joint deterioration or something in the long run. And whenever we look at force couple relationships, that's the, the nervous system knowing when to recruit which muscle to produce that, uh, that nice, clean, optimal, uh, optimal movement. 
articular system, that's going to be the skeletal system, that's going to be your joint position. And there's a, a, a slide that comes up in a little bit where we'll go over this again, but if the joint's not in the optimal position, then it's going to, it's going to influence the proprioception of the joint, which is going to influence the ability of all those muscles around the joint to do their job. So that's what corrective is going to do. We're going to try to, to bring somebody back into it as close to a normal alignment as we can. We're not seeking perfection, but we are seeking progress. We're going to try to bring them back into that normal alignment so that way we can fire the muscles, we can stabilize the joints, and we can keep that coordination and balance. All right. Thank you for that. Thank you for that explanation. And this is this is where it makes the connection. We want to uh, we want to have great range of motion through the joint stability. We want to have those force coupled relationships so all the muscles know what they're doing in their firing sequence. And we want to be able to do this throughout the kinetic chain with a nice coordinated movement. So let's continue with you, uh, Kyle. And let's talk about the, this is something new uh, to, the CE, uh, to the CES, and this is our assessment flow. Uh, can you take us through this and how this is going to fit the lifter? Yeah, so uh, new. It's newly presented with an infographic, but, but it's really not new. It's been in the textbook sure. since the, the beginning of time, but we did put some, uh, some nice little, little graphics in there. The when we look at an assessment flow, so we thought of this as, you know, thinking of assessments as an if then. If we see if in if then that goes all the way back to you know how computers communicate and all that type of fun stuff too. If we see this, then we're going to do this. If we don't see this, then we don't do that. Maybe we go do something over here. And what we're trying to do is streamline the process of the assessments because we see, especially in, in newer fitness professionals, this, this just becomes a, a whole lot of information that they gather from their athletes, yet they don't know what to do about it. So then it's that paralysis analysis and essentially it becomes a waste of the client's time because they perform these assessments, yet there's no strategies for execution. So client intake, as the name uh, uh, implies there, we have to interview our clients and athletes. We have to figure out their goals and all that stuff. Uh, getting more to, well, the next step there, static postural assessment. So the first thing we're going to do is take a look at, at how they stand. What's their static posture? This more often than not is going to be a representation of their habits, and it will give us a lot of information uh, about what they do throughout the day. However, Static posture doesn't always mean that they're going to have uh, poor movement or movement faults. So after we, we take that inventory of that static posture, we then have to look at the movement. So we have our transitional assessments, overhead squat, and the, the modifications of the overhead squat. I'm not going to go through this in a ton of detail unless we have questions, uh, but we use our modifications to try to narrow the focus. We want to try to figure out what is going to be or what is a potential primary cause of the compensation. And our two modifications are going to be elevating the heels, which does a couple of things. It takes the calves out of the equation and shifts center of gravity, which can improve the squat. And the other modification is going to be hands on the hips. So what we would do is take a look at that overhead squat, go through the modifications, and we would use that to, to pick our next step. Next step being, maybe we go down to those mobility assessments because they demonstrated uh, movement compensations, or if they didn't demonstrate any movement compensations, then we can go to our single leg squat uh, or the split squat. Split squat can be used if somebody's not comfortable on a single leg, or if we look at some of these, uh, some of these movements here, they could be applicable to your, your training for, uh, for lifting. If they do well in those assessments, then we have two options there. We have dynamic assessments, and these are going to be things like the uh, the less test, uh, tuck and jump, things of those nature, the Davies test for uh, upper extremity um, stability and control. And then we also can take them to loaded assessments, and that can be this can be another uh, great opportunity to fit in some of these Olympic lifts because we're going to look to see if the athlete can maintain that stability and support while under load. Um, and then we're going to use that information to, to design our 
program. And hopefully the goal is we spend the time up, up front here to really do the investigation. And then we can design very effective and efficient corrective exercise programs that ideally don't take up that much time. We're looking at 10 to 15 minutes as long as we do this upfront information the way we're supposed to. Okay. And as we go forward on this slide, you brought up a, a point and I want to tie that into our needs analysis before, uh, earlier. Uh, we talked about where technique may break down and, and where athletes are going to uh, need a little more help to help us dial down and really make this uh, corrective exercise uh, program unique for them. Uh, can you explain what's going on uh, here in, in some of these mobility assessments and what we want to, what information we want to get out of there? Yeah, so you could kind of think of these as being uh, um, the primary primary three, if you will. So in the text, we have several. But on that first picture on the top left, that's a real quick uh, dorsiflexion test. So we're using the weight-bearing lunge, lunge test there. All these tests as well, you just use your eyeball. The eyeball is a great pattern recognizer. So we just look at the quality of the motion. We look for symmetry. We want to make sure that uh, you know both sides are moving the same, or as Greg Cook says, if one side is tight and the other side isn't, uh, or if both sides are tight, I'm sorry, then you're just slow. And if one side is not tight, then you may rip yourself in half. Um, I think it's a little exaggeration, but you get the point. So the top left there, we're looking at ankle uh, dorsiflexion, weight-bearing lunge test, that one below. So that's a modified Thomas test. And here we're actually looking at, uh, it's primarily hip extension. So what we would be doing is that leg that's coming up to the gentleman's chest there, you grab the knee and pull that all the way in and that induces a posterior pelvic tilt. And then that down leg, we're looking to see if that can stay in a nice neutral extended position. And if we see compensations in these, so that weight bearing lunge test, the athlete can't reach the knee all the way to the wall while maintaining it in proper alignment in a neutral position of the foot. Or while in that supine position, we see uh, that, that down leg extend up, then that's going to tell us that we need to implement some mobility strategies. So that's going to be our step one and step two, where we would inhibit those myofascial tissues. And then we would try to, to perform some lengthening techniques there as well. Moving on to once the body. So the gentleman there is doing standing shoulder flexion. So this is looking at glenohumeral flexion, but we're also looking at thoracic extension to be able to get into that motion. Uh, the one next to that, we're looking at the, we're looking at internal and external rotation from an abducted position. So there we're looking at a couple of things. We're looking at those internal rotators ability to lengthen. Uh, but one of the things I think a lot of people miss with an external rotation test too, is we're also assessing the ability of that scapula to demonstrate some posterior tilting, which is going to be a nice stable uh, scapular position. Like Rodney said, that's going to help us with our, uh, that shoulder packed position, also looking for internal rotation there. And that's going to be important through that lift, going through that, uh, that, that upright type of a motion here. If we can't demonstrate internal rotation, then we're probably pulling into a, into a position here. We're doing something to the, the subacromial tissues or some other things in the glenohumeral joint. And Prentice, to that, a couple of things I'd like to point out relative to the, the weight lifts is when you're doing that modified Thomas test, you can have that person bring their knee up without their hands to start, and you can see which knee or if there is symmetry in both knees being able to come up into flexion before they grab it. And then once they grab it, does it still have the ability to come to the same level in hip flexion? So you can actually do hip flexion and extension using that same test, if, if that made sense. So I can have someone, without grabbing it, just bring their knee towards their chest, how far does that go on both sides? Does it equal or is it, a, is it a, 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 have asymmetry in it? You know what I'm trying to say, Kyle. And then when they grab it and pull it, can it still, do they both still come up and have the same amount of motion? Because you'll find that sometimes that will be a limiting factor uh, as well. And then when you're doing the, the, the shoulder flexion test, have them keep their elbows locked. Because a lot of people will come up, there, but they'll slight, start to bend their elbows and they'll come up and they can come up there. But as soon as you straighten that arm, it's a whole different world. So use, use those two little variances as, 
ways that you can make it a little bit more specific to what you'd be doing in, in the list. And, and, and real quick, if you don't mind me asking a question here, kind of selfishly, um, whenever we do these, the, the shoulder flexion test, we would generally stay uh, about shoulder width with our hands because we want to check that sagittal plane motion and the glenohumeral joint. Would you do the same for a lifter or would you have them go a bit wider if it relates more to their uh, the, the, the performance? Both. Because typically in, in the jerk, if you're coming from here, you're usually about shoulder width with your hands and you're going to bounce that up. When you're in a snatch, you're going to be at a wider grip. So you can have them come up in a wider grip and you can have them come up in a narrow grip. And just, just to be a little bit more specific, I would have palms facing because that's how they're going to be if they're holding the bar. A lot of times people will go neutral and that takes just a little less tension out of the system. So yeah. you cheat a little bit. Okay. That is all great stuff. So what I want to let everyone know out there is we're going to take you through a couple of case studies on our next webinar, which is coming up uh, Friday at the same time. But if we look uh, at the next uh, slide, can you take, just taking the, the shoulder rotation case, can you take us, uh, Kyle, uh, through the first three, through the first three steps in the corrective process? And then Rodney, could you share with us uh, some integration techniques that you may use from the Olympic weightlifting toolbox. Yeah, so the, on the on the first three there, one thing to understand, a lot of times corrective exercise, whenever people think about it, they picture, you know, a lot of a lot of a lot of things, maybe maybe a lot of balance exercises, BOSU and all those implements and tools have their have their place. But corrective exercise can be incredibly specific to what it is you need your your client or athlete to do. So I put these down here as examples, but it's really important to find a handful of exercises that work well. So the first one there in that inhibit. So we're doing a little thoracic spine rolling. One of the interesting things about the rolling the thoracic spine, we are actually trying to get movement in the thoracic spine so that roller as you're going across there, we're going to just encourage a little bit of movement into those joints to try to get us a little bit of uh, extension. And more often than not, this could be the client that, that demonstrated uh, arms fall forward and they weren't able to get their hands back to the wall. After we go through that, the young lady there, she's doing a little thoracic mobilization. That's going to be our lengthening technique. So with this, uh, we typically would do static stretching where you hold the end range for a specified period of time. But here, I would encourage uh, maybe six, eight to 10 reps holding the end range uh, about one to two seconds. And again, there, we're trying to get some motion in the thoracic spine. We've identified the inability to move or extend here. So we're using those four, those two steps to reintroduce that. That third step, activation, here we're going to try to bring some stability to the area now. And these are primarily going to focus on those scapular stabilizers. So she's doing a, a, a combo type of a motion. You probably can't see, but she's holding a little dowel rod in between her, uh, in between her hands. And what she's going to do here is go into a, a press motion and then a pull motion back towards her head, really trying to work on getting the movement there in the, in the shoulder blades, in the scapula, all the while stabilizing the rest of the body. So neutral alignment in the knees, ankles, uh, contraction of the glutes, core, getting that movement there in the in the scapula to activate those scapular stabilizers. Yeah, so, and those are great. And, and if you want to follow that up and keep it in the same kind of plane, you could now simply do and go back and do an overhead squat. So if you want to do a real simple thing, because what we went from the ball to the prone, just kind of going over now, Put the hands above head, whether you want to go slightly wider or slightly closer, and then now go into a squat, but go to where they can keep your, your ideal motion. Because remember, we want to try to re-ingrain or ingrain a proper neuromotor pattern, not just do something to, to try to do it. So see what the difference is, and it's also a way to get kind of a reassessment. What happened before? I did all this, now I'm going back, now what can I do and what does that, what does that help do? Because remember, there's a lot of overhead training and this is a great, very simple and great process to get strengthening, but an integrated motion with that strengthening of your shoulder girdle. So that's, that's one thing that you can work on that would be extremely simple. Now, all of the actions that we talked about, whether it's your drive shrug or whether it's the high pull, all of those could be part of your integrated techniques that you could use 
whether you went from the hip or the power position that we talked about. But the, some things that you can add into that that can be extremely beneficial is go into a balanced position. So let's just say we started at that power with the bar at our hip. And we just had just had a kind of a clean, a clean grip. So I'm basically outside of my hips, just outside of my hips. Have a slight hip flex position. And all I'm going to do is go into triple extension and hold my shoulders up. So I just pop the shoulders up, hold that, but I'm balancing there. So I'm making sure that the glutes are tight. I'm in a triple extended position holding that up and do that for 10 reps. See if you can hold that for a couple seconds. And what sounds easy becomes very, very difficult. Can I also do a high pull and hold that? So can I come up and do a high pull and hold that same position in triple extension? So you're teaching the body how to get in position. So your warm up is actually becoming part of your movement progression, but you're using it in an organized systematic process with this integration. Um, you can even do things from standing on your toes, holding, whether it's a dowel rod or a light bar here, and then dropping under the bar. So you can get up and hold and drop under the bar. So there's a lot of things you can do because that's also working on that thoracic extension and shoulder mobility as well. So just a few simple examples, just to keep very basic, that you start with your myofascial and work all the way through integration. And when you go through that, you're now either warmed up to do your training session or you're better prepared to do some more or lifting. And, and that point should be emphasized. This is the, the warm up or it is a, it is a piece of your warm up. I don't think I did a very good job of, of uh, really explaining that, but this is your new movement prep or whatever, you, whatever you want to call it. Right. It's, and I discussed that on Friday, how, how this is going to start being more of your, your, your movement. Yeah. And then on, on Monday, next Monday, we'll have specific programs that we can show you. Here's some of the exercises. Here's some examples of what that would look like. And I wanted to key back, key in on again, something you said, uh, you said, Rodney, this is an organized, systematized, this is targeted to the athlete in front of you. This isn't just like a canned run of the mill exercise that you would get in a, in a publication. So you are using this process to flesh out the best technique for your athletes uh, to, to get them to perform better with the Olympic lifts. And with that, we, I know we ran a little bit over today, but this was, uh, this was very good information. I hope all of you hung on. Uh, I didn't have the heart cut these gentlemen off. They were just uh, dropping, dropping a lot of knowledge today, and I hope that you appreciated that. Uh, right now, uh, you can start to submit your questions and uh, while we're waiting for those questions to come in, uh, today you can save 35% on the new CES. Uh, you can use the code WEBINAR20. Uh, that is a phone only code and you will call 888-773-187 to redeem your course. Again, that number is 888-773-187. 1827 to redeem your course, and that code is webinar20. Also, you can save 15% on Aleco Apparel and equipment. You will use the code NASM, that's NASM Web 15, and you can redeem that at uh, www.thinkware.us. Now, uh, Rodney, is this, uh, is this code case sensitive? Uh, yes. Uh, let me repeat this. The code is capital A-S-M, lowercase web, that's W-E-B-15. And you can go ahead and uh, redeem your uh, redeem uh, coupon for 15% off of the Laco gear. And while we're waiting for questions, uh, Rodney, let's start with you. Uh, do you have any takeaways for our listeners for this uh, webinar? Just a very warm thank you for being part of this. And now that we've set the stage, Friday and next Monday, we'll give more specifics on how this will look. You can transition this. So thank you all for being part of this. Love it. And, and thank you for sharing your, uh, your knowledge with us. Uh, I'm glad we're able to do this. And, and Kyle, do you have any uh, takeaways for uh, those who are still on with us? 
Um, just a, just a little bit. So going back to that OPT model, just remember that it is it's very dynamic. The 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 amount that goes into it, the the science, the research. So it's one of those where if you're skeptical because I have students skeptical. Just follow it, follow it for six weeks and see what uh, I promise you'll be, you'll become addicted to it. And then with the corrective exercise, again, just understand that it is specific to the athlete that's in front of you, just like Prentice said. So you don't need to don't think of it as being some odd form of training. It, it's going to be applicable to what it is they need to do. It's going to be your your flexibility. And it's going to be some some activation work. It's your new your new warm up. And I know you'll catch on to that a bit more whenever we go through our next two webinars. But that and thank you. Okay, and thank you, Kyle. We did get a few questions uh, that came in. Uh, this one is from Vito. Uh, and I think this one may be uh, for you, Rodney. Uh, he's curious. Uh, he's curious about the thoughts behind teaching from the hip first. I'm guessing uh, I, I can only speculate that he's talking about teaching, uh, uh, teaching the lift from the top down. I hope I'm not mis, uh, misrepresenting you, Vito, but uh, yes. can you go into that a little bit, uh, yes. Rodney? You know, first and foremost, whether you teach it top down or bottom up, that's relative to you and the context that you're in. I know a lot of people that will go from bottom up um, and different strength conditioning programs will go bottom up. And either way, it, it's okay. From the top down or teaching it from the hip down, we're just keeping the motions simple so they don't have to have the, the full complexity. That's all we're trying to do. Uh, so it doesn't, it, there's, there's no difference. There's no research that says if you do it one way versus the other way, there's any, anything that's gonna be better. Uh, we just wanna get people used to a simple extension with the actions involved and then we progress that into more flexion extension and then we get that down to the floor. Um, so that's the only reason there, there is no there is no specific, it's just trying to teach them from simple to a little bit more complex based upon the amount of movement. Could you debate it either way? Absolutely. So there is there is no right or wrong on that. Okay, thank you for that, Rodney. And now we have uh, actually have a couple of questions from Joseph, but I wanna ask this one to you, uh, Kyle. Uh, and Joseph wants to know, uh, shouldn't hip depth or angle of insertion of the uh, femoral head into the, into the socket determine foot orientation? Uh, it should definitely be considered. The question I would have is how are you going to explore that? If we, if we really want to try to figure out the angle of, of orientation of the femoral head, it takes more than just a few range of motion assessments and trying to eyeball some things. And that is uh, also one of those whenever Whenever we look at the studies that have reviewed the differences in hip anatomy, yes, there are some people that have structural differences, but it's really not as spread as uh, a lot of times we, we choose to think. In this one particular study, I cannot remember the authors, so forgive me, but their conclusion was unless your client or athlete has some sort of a pre-existing type of condition, then we must assume, which I know a lot of people don't like that word, assume things all the time, we must assume that they fall into a normal category or a normal range. So it's worth considering, but just, just keep in mind the the way you test it is is not as easy as, as some position it. Okay, thank you for that. And uh, now we have a question uh, from Justin. And uh, Justin wants to, I think this is for you, uh, Rodney. What advice do you have for a trainer without Olympic weightlifting experience, and uh, and you get a client that needs you to train them? Well, I would say go get in a course and learn and, and practice with yourself. But and we have you here. Uh, <laughs> we have you, you here, Rodney. Go, go ahead and take that and get some information. Uh, that's. That's the easiest way to do it. So we're, we're in the process of getting our, our education online. So pretty soon in the next few months, we'll have all of our courses online. Uh, depending on where you are, uh, you can always ask to have your course, have a Lego course. But that's specifically what we do is we teach the trainers how to systematically and simplistically learn how to perform them so you're confident and confident. 
but then you coaching cues on how to specifically teach them and train other people to do them and and realize and kind of to princesses what's your takeaway message it's messages do not feel like you have to perform a full complete lift to have any benefit or effect uh, people who are starting out, if if people would just do simple components of the list and there's countless derivatives ways to train certain things, whether it's coming, whether it's getting under the bar, whether it's lifting the bar off the floor, whether it's getting through the poles, if we would just start practicing those, being down, can I start? What's the best and easiest for me to start? Do, is it the floor or should I start at the hip and work my way down? Floor up, hip down. And then just go through the actions. Can I first do this? Can I first get up triple extension and balance? Can I get up in a triple extension and go to a high pull? Can I get up on a pull and then can I get under? Or can I get up on a high pull and catch the bar? Just doing that, not about weight, specifically worried about technique and form. And that's the best process to build confidence in anybody, whether it's yourself or a client. And that gives them the desire to move on. What happens is people will try to load it up on weight because they see the Olympics doing, see com competitors doing that. And these are skill movements. And so if you just keep them simple and light to where you can practice the skill of it, that will give you the confidence to want to continue. And that's what you want. You want to be able to, because they're great lifts. They're great lifts for all kinds of aspects of the body, like we said. So that would be my suggestion. Okay, great. And we have time for uh, more. We ran way over. Uh, but uh, this question comes from Brian. And in terms of programming, in a prospective case, uh, before injury or imbalances, how would you program these into a weekly routine? And like we talked about, now this is open for both of you gentlemen, but like we talked about earlier, this is, uh, we're taking this information and putting these exercises into the 10 or 15 minutes that you would do your regular movement prep. Just keep in mind that these are going to be more targeted and focused and unique to the person in front of you. So uh, having said that, I will let uh, Rodney and Kyle take this, uh, take this away. Take it away. I'll start if you don't mind, because I'll touch on a, one of the things from a corrective perspective should hopefully, I mean, ideally this would be correct, would be a preventative process. So we would still perform the assessments the, the same way. We would still go through that same process, try to see if we can notate any sort of limitations. And then we would still design a corrective strategy to try to prevent anything from happening in the future. And then like Prentice just said, uh, it's going to be a short amount of time. So 10 to 15 minutes, we're going to do some rolling, some stretch and some activation, and then we'll be prepped and ready, ready to move as far as the Olympic lifts themselves. I got nothing. Yeah. And, and, and I'll just tag on to that. So that's the first and foremost is the, one of the easiest ways is to build some of that into the actual warm up, which the corrective exercise is essentially your your warm up or movement prep or whatever term you use for that and that can be the integration component that works really easy which we just talked about you could do two or three integration exercises and that could be the the the, the beginning and that might be all you're working and then you go into a regular training session whatever so it, it, it's going to be dependent upon one your ability level two what are you programming are you programming specifically for weightlifting, are you programming for strength and conditioning, or are you programming for general fitness? So that's that's a whole other realm. Then once you've done the warm up, then you can specifically break it down into what are you going to be doing? Are you going to be working on snatch today, and is it going to be snatch with something else? Is it going to be snatch, and then are you going to do deads? You're going to do something else. So that's where you you can program in what's your ability level. How much are you going to do? How specific are you going to be doing with it? And then what kind of preface do you need? Where where are you from a, a corrective standpoint? So you may have great ability of done it, but you have some correction that you need. So that's there's a lot of variables that go into that particular question. Are you yeah. correctly, what's your ability level and what's the environment or the focus of the program? 
and some of our follow-up webinars too, especially whenever we we present the templates. I think the way our our little teaser, the way our templates are laid out, it, yeah. it can really help to answer answer that yeah. question too. Yes. So thank you. And again, sorry for apologize for running over today. This was a re uh, again. Thank you, gentlemen, for your knowledge and expertise. This really set the table for the two upcoming webinars in which we'll dive a little bit deeper uh, into the corrective process, so that uh, and give you some cases, so that you can start thinking about how you would implement this for your clients. And as Kati, on the final day, uh, a week from today, you will leave with templates that will show you show you how to program uh, uh, Olympic weightlifting corrective exercise in a way that's consistent with the OPT model. Uh, so thanks again, everybody. Uh, for those of you who stayed on for, for this hour plus, and we'll see you on Friday. Have a great day. Thank you guys.